Welcome to Weekend Walkabout. Yeah, here we are, back in our gardens and yours virtually. I'm from, Steve and Nicola. I'm Janet McConovich, and we're garden a to zorg and we're talking about diagnosing problems, learning from losses, moving into the fourth of four chapters called Control and Loop Back. And more important, the loop back. We're working off of this outline, which you can download from our website in the About Us webinars section. And what we're working on are some very simple statements. Control. And the thing to know is that there are always options. Identify what your options are. Apply them. That's and apply them least, least to impact. least impact to broad, you know, to the broadest impact. Right. There so are things all, that just don't impact our environment as much. Right. Start with the things that are targeted rather than the cannons. Um, and, and we're not going to do a lot on control, but remember those two things. There are always options, always, always, always options. And, and one of them is do nothing. Right, one of them is do nothing. And, and most important with that is you must go back to then observing the plant. If you don't pay attention to what worked, then all the work you did to figure it out is for nothing. So we told you about Veronicastrum, Culver's root, beautiful plant, blooms in July. Isn't that gorgeous? And, had, had Where it, it's right, it stands up so straight. Right at our garden, we were staking it up. I said, "Why am I staking this up?" And then I had some black stems on it. We moved it less than 15 feet from a drier area to a wetter area, and never again had to do anything to it. So one of the things, one of the control options is cultural. Treat it differently. Give it more water, less water, more sun, less sun, more move, air. Yeah, more air. Those are all cultural controls, and and it includes varieties. Um, this variety of Culver's root, can you see the pink on it, is a, a, a related species. It's Veronicastrum sibiricum, and it doesn't need it quite as wet as our native Veronicastrum virginicum, this one right there. This is more pure white. So you can always switch varieties or switch species. Um, here's Phlox. It's on the left. The sprinkler head is there, uh, raised above the big betony. Those are big betony leaves on the right, flocks, tall flocks on the left. That is a disease-resistant phlox called orange perfection. But I looked at it and went, uh-oh, this was about three weeks ago. Can you see what I did? Take a look at before on the left, after on the right. Thin it. I have removed stems. If I'd caught it earlier in the year and been on time in gardens, I would have lifted the whole plant and divided it and put just four pieces back in again, four stems back in again. It's a tough area where it's up against a fence, fence. with something growing in back of it. You that have I don't to have open anything. that up as much as you can to let the air flow. So what I did is in the center, there were daffodil leaves growing up in it. I've cut the daffodil back. You can do that. It does not kill them. I've cut all daffodil foliage down now. I've cut the daffodil foliage back and I took out all discolored leaves because that's mildew. It's not white, but it's killing the leaves already before it gets to the point where the mildew can create the white funk, white spores. And I took a lot out. It's on the left there. That will make all the difference. And then there's a next one to do. There's, if you look up to, oh, uh, there's a, there's, there's a, um, there. There's a flox there, there and, a, and an evening primrose next to it that has to be yanked back. You need air, and that's a cultural control and makes all the difference. That's mildew. That's, that's mildew. That's instant death mildew. Right, it's mildew that works so fast on a leaf, so susceptible, and that's a plant, a flox that I go, I'm yanking that guy out. If Don't gets, even bother. If it gets mildew that badly, I'm taking that guy out of here. Um, cultural controls include releasing ladybugs. And we talked about buying those from Arbico Organics or buying them at your garden center and releasing them or just encouraging them. Um, Try not to spray to don't kill mosquitoes. Don't spray pesticides. Just don't spray pesticides. If you can avoid it at all, it makes all the difference. Predators are just, can be very numerous when allowed to live when and, there's food. And, and they work 24 seven. Look what I, deer do. When I, we give them food, sorry. I cried when I was uh, I was pregnant with Sonia, and I was standing out by my spireas, which had aphids on them, and I, I I literally cried. I said, "I'm sorry, you guys. I can't deal with any of this stuff. I'm growing a baby, and I can't handle that stuff. So you're going to have to do this on your own." I never ever again have had to spray aphids with anything other than water. Knock them off with hard water with a hard spray of water let the ladybugs work on them, it, they take care of themselves. We've been trained to spray chemicals 
as a first resort. And still being and trained. we should be waiting until later. So I'm looking here at clematis. This is clematis wilt. Clematis gets a fungus problem. If I cut it back and let it grow back, it'll probably grow back. But it's also growing, if you look in the top corner, it's growing in a very tight area. There's no air movement there at all. Move the clematis, you guys. The worst problem there is the euonymus next to it. See the notching on the leaf? That would be your key word there, notching. They're not chewing all the way through to the rib. Weevils, Some do. But weevils eat chunk, from the outside in. So chunk. do caterpillars, not slugs, not many, many kinds of, uh, of scraping beetles. And you look and go, okay, euonymus, notched leaves. And you find out, oh man, it's that black, black vine. vine weevil, which eats hundreds of things, including your coral bells and does most of its damage as that little thing that looks like a, a rice grain in there. That's the grub over the winter, grazing on roots just like a sheep grazes on grass. Munching away. And one of them can kill a plant over the winter time. You have a bunch of them, you're in trouble. I looked around in that garden and said, okay, here's 2011, here's 2013. It looks a little better, but not very much better. And I start looking around in the garden and go, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. That's on Burginia, notching. The leaves of the vernal sweet pea, notice on the right, are not, they're chewed on the inside. That's a slug or a scraping beetle. That's not notching, but there's also notching. I said, oh man, the vernal sweet pea are getting hit by two things. And I went through the garden and found it was everywhere. That's one where I did, we did hire a company to come in and spray one of the um, systemic insecticides at just the right time in late August, beginning of September, um, I'm sorry, at just the right time in July when the vine weevils were just coming out to kill the adults. And then we added to the soil a beneficial nematode, a predator, and watered it in well in late August and early September in order to kill any grubs that had survived. And that made a difference, but it's a running battle with those guys. It's timing, it, uh, once you decide, if you decide to go any control, that timing is critical. The the hit the pest when it's the most susceptible. Yeah. If you're putting it down too early, you're wasting money. If you're putting it down too late, you're wasting money. Yeah. And time. Yeah. And, and probably chemicals. affecting something else. So always loop back and start watching again. So we're pruning a, a Japanese maple. I'm showing people. Someday we're going to do this again, you guys. We're going to do we really by Janet and Steve, and, and we'll be able to go out and do things together again. But I looked, I said, that was in 2011. The tree was looking like this. We cut the branches back. It had gotten too big. We shouldn't have waited so long, we told the owner, but we cut it back. And now you've got to watch. And when we cut it back, what we found, one of the things that we found that happened was that the trunk, which had some damage from when it was younger, was going to be damaged again because it wasn't shading itself We, we took much. too much to shade that wasn't shading. It, it should have been shaded. So we treated that Japanese maple like we treat this little one that was at Steve's mom's out in the open. Every winter, I covered the trunk with something. It was south-facing. It was going to get sun. and Was in a bad place. Mom, you don't need a Japanese maple here, but she wanted one. She liked it. So we've got evergreen branches uh, uh, tied onto the trunk to shade it. They're just on the sunny side. We've just tied them around. And you remove them in the spring. One year, I was cutting back a false, a, a Alaska false cypress, so I just threaded the whole false cypress down there and turned it into a false cypress for the winter time. One time, I turned it into a hemlock. Yep. Just stuck the whole top of the hemlock down there. One time, it was a grass. Yep, it's that's a Ms. Japanese Stampus. maple, but we took that grass and cut it up in pieces in in bunches and strapped it to the trunk. And we write these things up so that. You, many of you are seeing this problem on your Japanese maples and don't realize that's what it is. It's the sun hitting that. Fine gardening wouldn't take this article, you guys. They, uh, they seem to think that it was too technical. They like prettier pictures. But that's what happens. It starts. It starts small and gets bigger. And then one day the tree dies. One July day. So protect the trunk, shade the trunk. That's the grass. The grass you bundled it, it, threaded them down used bungee cords and wrapped them around and said, there, now you're a grass. Looks very good all through the winter. We do that, this is another client's house and I'm only doing it on the side that faces the south and her house. Yeah. Yep. Okay, now reality. It takes time to do these things, to look things up. Not everyone allows it for us. They go, just do something. They won't let me look into it. But 
all we can do is try and we're really glad boy are we glad we went digital uh, so that we, i didn't want to at first but no, but we can look back and you can look back mark your picture somehow so you can see the progress of things whether they're better or worse from year to year and we use the internet a lot but just beware of the the bad stuff out there look for dot just like edu, dot gov sometimes you see uh, bot um, and dot org um, and uh, bot would be um, well anyway, botanical, botanical garden. gardens um, look for your own uh, extension services I yes it's not just Michigan State that has the growing degree days you see they're there and and use your search engine on your computer use the same search engine all the time what I've learned, Sonia, who's a professor of, of, uh, at a university, and I did a search one day on the same substance. We were looking at a substance that I said was in a plant, in a, uh, uh, a product that we use. And Sonia said, well, I looked that up, and it comes back as like toxic. I said, well, that's amazing. We both did the same search. What I got were the horticultural articles that explained how this item is being used. What she got was kind of the fool's gold Because... Stuff. Google knew what they were searching right. and You're, what they searched for and what they clicked on to see what they wanted to read. We worry, and it's, it's, it's well-founded, that search engines are gathering information about us, but they're also gathering information that feeds Help into us. the logarithms and starts fine-tuning your searches. So use your, use your internet. Use our website, um, and it's .org. I forgot about that. I, we talked about changing those, and we forgot to do it. So you can find our pictures and we we connect you to where we found the information. So for instance, University of Florida was the one that gave me the aha that found Kermi scale, Oak Kermi scale. Yeah. And I found afterwards that they took that one down. I said, why I had to search all over. I, from from one day to the next, it was gone. So you want to capture where you got things from so that you can find Quickly. it again. Because once I got that name, Allo Kermi's King Yi, I could find it in other um in other journal articles. She just likes names like that to say them. King Yee, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, lots of good information through it, through uh, Extension Universities. I, I go for entomology reports. It, they're terribly dry to read, but they're your good things to look at. Um, and they'll take you through your, your search results and you can look through quickly and figure out where you want to go. Um, Pest ID at Michigan State takes you to their bulletins. Same thing with Massachusetts, Ohio, Illinois, Pennsylvania. They'll refer you to their bulletins, which are where you find the good, ugly pictures. You don't find these ugly pictures on some of those image searches. Most or us, in yeah, magazines. Most of us, yeah, most of us don't see the magnifying kind of things. No. Tar spot, people ask about it a lot. Once you know it's a spot, you'll find it. Maple, spot, and tar spot will come up. Doesn't go into the trunk, into the wood. Same thing with vegetables. Oh my gosh, distorted carrots. Go look it up. And just be savvy with your image searches because they do go to a lot of things that show you just flowers. Stay away from those. You need to go to image searches that take you to some of the ugly things. And oftentimes to really narrow searches down, you do have to use a scientific name. It's as a, it's tough a, as it is. It's to, a quick way to do it. You don't have to know how to pronounce it. Just have to spell it into it or spelling. copy it into it. I can't pronounce. So I told you, you've got growing degree day trackers for all your different states. Uh, um, in, in universities that tell you your growing degree days. So we've been through that. And books are still high on our list, really. Um, we use a lot of books. Uh, our pest books stay on the top shelf where we with a, are most accessible. And even, even older books are still very, very valuable. And um, what we love are the books, the pest books that have indexed by host plant. So I can look up the plant, myrtle. I can look up the plant, olea, olive. And it gives me a list of the things that happen to that plant. Those are, so when you're looking at books, maybe you're at used bookstores, um, mm -hmm. they're still fun to go and look at, or somebody recommends a book to you. Check the index. You wanna know host plant. You wanna be able to find by the plant what happens to it. Um, so Steve was out walking in the field and he came home and he said, look at this. And I forgot to put a picture in. That's okay, but I flipped over the book. I said, I found that one before, it's yep. this one. Um, this, this particular book that has an index to host plants, it's on your list, it's the uh, insects that feed on trees and shrubs, has all of the caterpillars in one group. And I actually flipped through back in the old days before the internet, looking for which caterpillar might this be. That was my textbook when I was in college. That's Euonymus webworm. And it only feeds on Euonymus. 
which is kind of nice. Yeah. Um, we've told you before that we like diseases and pests of ornamental plants by Pascal Perone because it goes by plant name. So it gives me cupressus or cypress. And in order, not in alphabetical order, but in order of most likely to be seen disease. So canker first, other diseases next. Insects in the, on the fold, the first one you're gonna see is aphid, then mealybug, then caterpillars. So it, it's, a plant, it's a book that helps you sort out what's most likely to happen to your plants. No color pictures in Perone. And yes, a lot of information that says spray it with this, spray it with that. You don't need to use the control information. You yes. need the identification. It's the identification that helps you. And the life cycle. And for growers of vegetables, you want to get in, you want to get bulletins from your university. You want to get tomato diseases in their control. Um, and you want to get scouting of house plants for it. You want to get these books because they're the great pictures. And now most of those pictures are online. That's the really wonderful thing. That's a uh, handbook of, of uh, leaf, dis diseases leaf diseases in the greenhouse. Yep. So that's what we brought for you today. And uh, now we can fit in what probably one question. It's 10.03. We came close today. Um, I will do the chat. I'm going to this afternoon. I'm not dressed with my suspenders today because we've got to go pick up a truck. Our truck has been out of commission. Got to go work on that and then uh, work with the grandkids on a teepee. But tomorrow, I promise, I'll get to all these questions that Sonia has been accumulating. So what have we got that we can do before people meet? One question. That is, that is a really hard one. Oh, my goodness. Um, OK, Marita, because uh, she used the word please, she said, please advise on Amelanchia that bloomed beautifully and is producing fruit but has orange-yellow leaves dropping. What's wrong? Scab. It's a fungus disease. Take one of the leaves that's not dropped, go off of the plant itself and hold it up to the light. And what you've got is you've got a scab infection or a mildew infection or both. And chances are that your tree is too tight. Um, is it a multi-trunked amelanchier or service berry? If it is, it's grown that way because we consumers seem to like multi-trunked trees. And chances are you need to cut it out. It crowds, they crowd each other off and, and their air circulation again, it's, it's not going big, through. It's the big thing. And again, how many of the leaves are falling too, right. it could affect the fruit. Yep. Our, our amelanchier at our house, our service period at our house, when we moved in, I said, oh good, I've always wanted to have an amelanchier. But the thing had nine trunks. I've got it down to five and I'm still going to take one more out. Um, it doesn't need all this. It's, I, you're probably going to need to thin it out. You can spray for, fun, for fungus problems on crab apples and amylite gears, but you need to spray as a prophylactic. You can't cure it once it's in the leaf. It wouldn't have needed to be sprayed earlier. Another thing that you can do for that tree, besides thin it out, which it probably needs, is water and fertilize better. Um, if you water and fertilize um, regularly on crab apples and on service berries, the leaves expand more quickly get a cuticle cover more quickly, and are more resistant to fungus problems. All right, do we want to do another one, or are you guys going to head let's, out? Let's, let's do one more, and then you send me the questions. And I know that's making it hard for you to pick which one. Nope, it's not, not, not a problem. I actually do have a question right, from, yes. um, from Sue, who is hiding his mic today. Um, she is asking, <laughs> uh, how do I get rid of rabbits eating my plants? Kind of a oh, perfect way man. to start. <laughs> rabbits are We hot. have a lot this year. Yeah, there are, there are three, three things to think about with, um, with any kind of pest. It's food, water, shelter. Deny them shelter. So a lot of times they hide under a bush and, and dot, they, they eat mostly the thing they can reach from underneath the bush. With they're them. coming for you for the food. Right, they're coming to you for the food. So um, either exclude them from the food or make the food taste bad with, with things that smell bad, or give them something else to eat. Um, they like clover. They like Dutch white clover, that stuff that some people kill in their lawns, but makes a great addition to a lawn. See them <coughs> some Dutch white clover somewhere, give them something else to eat. No, don't put carrots out there. They don't want to chew on carrots. They want fresh greens. For, they like the greens. greens. Yeah, yes. so food, water, shelter. You can't do much about the water, but the food and the shelter, you have to think of ways to do it. Um, we, we fence out rabbits and you use very small, chicken wire does not work. A small rabbit, the hungriest of them, can fit through chicken wire. I saw one run through a uh, chain link fence. Run, it never slowed down, it ran right through the chain link fence. So you need rabbit hutch wire, which is called uh, hardware cloth, real small. And, and uh, we told people 18 inches would keep them out and one year George called us and mm -hmm. said, 
I am watching them scale the, the fence. I am watching the rabbits climb. Um, rat, uh, George then resorted to uh, Dave Beatty at Penn State said, if they eat my food, I eat them. Um, he started shooting them. <laughs> there comes a point where eradication, or not eradication, yeah, well, you got to control the population control. somehow because it does population happen. control. I is hope necessary. that that's I hope that that's some help, Sue, because it is it is terrible. We're we're dealing with squirrels and deer eating our stuff right now, and it's just awful to say we're so nice to them. Why do they aim for our really nice plants? And, and fortunately, we don't have a heavy deer population where we're at. They just wander through, but some of our clients have where they stay. Herds, they stay, and they are herds. They are, yeah. you know, yeah. eight eight strong come walking through. And that's exclude them. The fencing is... Yeah, in botanical gardens, they, they exclude. Exclude works, but it's expensive to do and takes some time to do. What do we know? Lizzie was asking about choke cherry tree blooms. Then the berry stem becomes distorted into a horn-like protuberance. No berries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Score one for the Go ahead. black knot. Yeah. Steve black. said we wanted to put a picture in a black knot. And I said, oh, well, they're not going to see it now this time of year. Black knot is a fungal disease of, of the rose family and particularly bad on all of the cherries, including choke cherry. And what's happening is that that fungus is infecting the, the, the flower blossom. Someplace on that choke cherry, and you'll probably see them best when the leaves are I'm gone. Sorry, I I know. Know. There are some branches that look so. like they've, been, they've gotten thickened and turned black in some places, black knot. You need to prune off all of the black knot. And you might find that you have a typhoid mary someplace nearby that's bad. Maybe it's got a, a ton of it on it. Yeah, and you need to get rid of that plant. But um, pruning, manual control, can generally take care of black knot. You darn you. <laughs> <laughs> that happens so infrequently <laughs> when I do. I I chirp, chirp, chirp. Thank I you promise very this much. was this was not planned. I had no idea that was a conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you very very much for being here today. You you thank, and you, thank everybody. you for the questions. I will sit down tomorrow. Steve and I will sit down and we'll get those written into a chat and send that out with the, with, the, with the key for the recording of this video. So we hope you have a trouble-free growing season. We'll uh, be back with more uh, We Can Walk About next Take week. Take care, be safe. What are we doing next week? Have good gardening. We are doing oh. trees and shrubs for small spaces. Steve's topic next week. And we're, on to, we're on to Steve's uh, one of One uh, of the territory. things I really love. So, so thank you for coming, we'll see you later. Be well. Take care everybody.